scariest and most terrifying thing people have ever seen or heard. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. One night, my boyfriend and I were driving home around 1 a.m. The incident happened quickly, but it felt like slow motion as we witnessed it. An older man was stumbling across the street while we had a green light. We were about 30 feet away, and we saw another car with zero time to react. The guy got hit by a car going about 45 miles per hour. He flew up high, but miraculously, he remained alive. Immediately upon the impact, I called EMS, and they arrived in about three minutes. The driver who hit him got out of the car, and the overwhelming smell of weed filled the air. Surprisingly, the man who got hit, heavily intoxicated from a night of drinking, opted not to press charges or take any legal action. As far as I know, everyone involved is okay, and the legal system wasn't brought into the situation. It was a messed up situation, though. A few years ago, in my third year of finally getting a job at a school as a teacher, I had the nicest colleague. Every morning we would stop and chat about sports or students, he knew all the families in the area, so if you had a problem in your class, he was the one to talk to about how to best approach the situation. The school is in an impoverished area, and the clientele is a little rough around the edges. You would call this teacher a pillar of the community, he worked there for 30 years, lived in the neighborhood, was a graduate of the area, was loved by both parents and students, and was one of the nicest men I've met. However, he was very unhealthy and probably should have retired years ago, I found out later that he had congestive heart failure. He collapsed outside my classroom full of 7th grade students, and when I popped my head outside the class, I saw one of my friends by his side. The desperation in his face still haunts me from when he just screamed at me, help. He knew I had been a lifeguard for many years and that I knew CPR, so I ran to help him. We did CPR for 10 minutes while the ambulance came, and I can still see the dead look in his eyes and the taste of his mouth. I know first responders and doctors deal with this daily, and I was lucky enough to have a long lifeguarding career without seeing anyone die, but seeing the face of someone you interact with daily on the ground still haunts me. I still work in that class and walk past where I saw my colleague die daily. I know there was nothing more I could have done, but I still have flashbacks of walking down that hall. Sorry this got so long. Maybe it was therapeutic. When I was 18, I stopped my car because I saw another car stopped on the side of the road. We were on top of a hill, but it didn't go down on the side the car was stuck on. The lady had gotten out, and we started to push, with her pushing the back and me right next to her. Another car came flying over the hill and slammed into the back of her car, hitting and killing her immediately. It missed me by what felt like an inch. I don't know how to explain it after that. The guy who was driving got out of the car and started talking to me, but I didn't hear any of it. The lady was just on the ground, not moving. One moment she was alive, and the next she was gone. It was so fast and terrifying that I had no idea what to do. You know those moments in movies where the character witnesses something awful and the sound goes away and they can only focus on the thing they witnessed? It felt like that, I guess. Sorry, I am terrible at explaining this, but yeah. It has never left my mind to this day, man, it was so messed up. Some time ago, I went on a hunting trip with my older brother and his friend Kurt. The plan was to hike halfway up a mountain, set up camp, and then hunt from there the next day. Shortly after we set out, Kurt realized that he had forgotten his tent. It was cold and forecasted to snow, so both of us offered to share our tents with him, but he figured that would be gay so he decided instead to make a hammock out of a tarp that we had. We got to a suitable campsite and set up the two tents and the hammock before going to bed. Sure enough, it started to snow. Kurt still insisted on sleeping in the hammock, and we were too tired to try and convince him otherwise. Sometime during the night, Kurt partially woke up. He said he thought he had felt something bump the bottom of the hammock, but he hadn't been fully awake and didn't know if it was his imagination or not, so he ignored it and went back to sleep without a second thought. Until morning. I woke up first and left the tent. There was about an inch and a half of snow covering the ground, and to my amusement, it covered Kurt in his hammock as well. I went over to make a snide comment about how dry I had been in the tent all night, and that's when I saw the tracks. They were definitely cougar tracks, and given the fact that it had snowed all night, they were super fresh. What's more, they went right under the hammock where Kurt had been sleeping. We figured the bumping in the night had been the cat smelling him. Needless to say, Kurt shared a tent for the rest of the trip. I was 16 and worked with a family friend as an apprentice, laying flooring. We were carpeting a dentist office in the town where I live. 
my boss had forgotten about a basketball game his son had going on and said we could just pack up real quick and I could get off early because he had to leave to make the rest of the game. I told him I would stay and at least finish the waterfall pattern we were going to do on the staircase leading into the basement where the storage was, and he agreed to let me finish it on my own. The dentist, his wife, and their three kids were all in the building because they were putting finishing touches on the offices as the business was new and hadn't opened yet. While I was on the stairs, his two oldest kids, about four and six years old, were naturally interested in the guy smashing stuff with a tack hammer, so I let them watch but told them they had to stay above me so I didn't have to watch behind me. The dentist came to let me know he was leaving to do whatever it was he had to do and that his wife and kids would stick around till I finished so she could lock up. He asked if the kids were bothering me, and I said no, I was fine if they wanted to watch. He told his wife that the kids were on the stairs with me and left. About one hour after he left, I heard something no one wants to hear. It was the most disturbing scream I've ever heard to this day. I immediately thought the wife was being robbed or worse, so I made the kids who were on the stairs with me hide in the basement, and I ran to where I heard the screams coming from with my claw hammer in hand and walked in on the most terrifying scene you could imagine. There was the wife on her knees screaming up at the ceiling, and when I got around her, I saw why. Her 18-month-old was upside down in a 5-gallon bucket of bleach water she was cleaning with. I don't know why she didn't immediately pull him out, maybe she thought too much time had passed. I'm not sure, but as soon as I saw his little body in there, I grabbed him out, and that's when I froze for, like, two seconds or more, but he was as blue as a smurf, and my heart just sank. I then switched right back into I gotta save this kid. No way can this happen. I couldn't live with myself if this kid dies right here in front of me, so I started CPR, and let me tell you all something, child CPR and adult CPR are not the same thing. Luckily, I attended camps in my youth that taught me these skills to save people with CPR. I was doing CPR for about 5 minutes before that wonderful little child spewed the water in his lungs all over me and started crying. It was, to this day, the best feeling I've ever felt. His mother was so distraught she didn't know what to do, so I handed him to her and told her to go to the hospital right now and don't worry about rounding up the other kids. I would watch them till someone came back and got them. So she took off out the door and went to the hospital. About 45 minutes later, the husband showed up and, without saying a word, grabbed me in the biggest bear hug ever and couldn't stop, thanking me. I told him that I was just doing what anyone else would have done and that I was glad his little one was okay. The moral here for everyone is to learn CPR because one day someone might depend on you to save their life, and you will never have a feeling of accomplishment like saving a life. Fear on the face of a flight attendant. Flying out of DFW, the pilot announced that we'd be taxiing in a hurry to try and beat a squall moving toward the airport. The flight attendants strapped themselves in in a hurry, we taxi, and then start rolling down the runway. We reach speed and take off, then start to gain altitude. I'm watching the ground drop away out the window. Then it feels like the bottom drops out and the ground starts getting closer fast. Downdraft? Microburst? I look up into the face of the flight attendant, and her eyes are bugged and her mouth is open like she's about to scream. I feel total, utter terror. I don't remember thinking, I'm going to die. I just remember seeing her face and feeling the cold wash of adrenaline for a second or two before the wings got their lift back and we started climbing again. She took a long, deep breath, and once the plane settled down, she went back to flight attendant things. Ever since, I've been a bit jumpy about takeoffs and landings. I was sleeping on my couch one afternoon. My wife was out of the house, just me home. I woke up from a weird dream that I don't remember and started to sit up and I felt only what I can describe as a small pop inside of my head. I had an instant, excruciating headache and was super dizzy, and everything got really blurry and weird, and I started to lay back down. I looked on the floor and saw my phone, and I reached for it to call my wife. When my hand got to my phone, my hand just didn't work. My fingers wouldn't grasp it correctly, I kept dropping it. I thought I heard footsteps in the other room, and it occurred to me that maybe she came home while I was sleeping, so I tried to yell her name, but all that came out was a weird moan. When I heard myself make that sound, I was just straight up terrified. I couldn't make normal vocal sounds. I was totally aware that nothing was working right, and I kept trying to yell, but nothing happened but weird moaning, and my hands just would not work. I started feeling lightheaded and remembered leaning back over to lay my head down, and I just blacked out and got this sensation of falling inside my head. The headache was gone, all I felt was the falling sensation and overwhelming fear. I believed I had died or that I had had a massive stroke or something. Then nothing. Minutes? Hours? Later, my wife came in the door and woke me up, and I sat up, right where I had fallen over. Everything worked. My phone had definitely been moved, 
so I must have messed with it in my sleep, and I was sleeping at an odd angle. I had a pretty massive headache, too, but I suffer from frequent migraines, so that's not very weird. Anyway, to this day, I don't know if I just dreamed it all or what. I'm guessing it was a dream, but it's the scariest I've ever experienced and the most undreamy thing I've ever dreamed. Besides that, the most scared I've ever been was when my parents got divorced. I was living with my dad and brother on a farm. My mom moved out, and one day my dad took me out to the edge of the pasture and told me to dig a hole. He'd marked it off. It was the size of a grave. Three feet wide, seven feet long, six feet deep. I dug through the soft dirt and, after a few hours, had the hole pretty well dug. The whole time, I was imagining that he'd lost his mind and was going to kill us all and bury us in the hole. I kept digging it, though, thinking it would buy me time to think of a plan. After I got it dug, though, he said, good. Now we got a new good trash hole. Our trash had been building up since my mom had left, so we dumped a few 55 gram barrels of garbage into the hole and burned it. I once rode into town in the midst of an ethnic lynching. I was in Africa at the time, and five Fulani herdsmen who were robbing market trucks and raping the women had been caught and brought into the local jail. Now, robbing people gets you lynched every time in Africa, but their ethnicity makes it all the more vehement. The atmosphere was surreal. As my unwitting self on my motorcycle rolled into town, it was like the physical properties of the air had changed, as if the atmosphere had a hint of electricity. It was quiet and still, but chilling and tense. Two young men glared at me from the side of the road. It was now obvious that the regular rules of society were suspended. The town was totally empty. The shops were abandoned. Everyone was at the jail, thronging outside and roaring for the prisoners. It now dawned on me that I had waded into a lynching. I rode by, as I needed to, in order to get to my destination. I had been to the town many times and had several friends there. I received no friendly looks this time. I wasted no time. Five men were going to be beaten within an inch of their lives, along with numerous other indignities, castrated, pissed on, injected with feces, before being finally doused with gas and lit on fire. My white skin is usually an ingratiating novelty, but I now feel horrifyingly conspicuous and different. I got to my friend's house, he was away, closed the door, locked it, and didn't even peek outside until the morning. One of the bodies was still at the roundabout, a twisted and black sculpture. I was with my family in Mont-Tremblant, Quebec, Canada, and we had rented mountain bikes to go through the trails. At one point, there was a steep downhill bend around a small construction site, and there were small parts of the road missing and cones everywhere. I slowed down and passed the area, and then quickly looked back to see if the others had passed it without any problems, I was out in front. Once I saw they were fine, I turned back to look forward to find out I was headed right off a cliff, maybe 30 to 40 stories up, into a rocky ravine. I had a split second to turn my bike and slam into a tree in order to stop myself from basically falling to my death. I slammed into the tree head first. I dislocated my shoulder and suffered a minor concussion, but holy shit, that split second where I thought I was going to die was the most intense fear I've ever experienced. I remember falling backwards after hitting the tree and noticing my helmet wasn't on my head, so I touched my face. I was so out of it that my face and skull didn't feel normal and felt all bumpy, and I thought I had broken my skull all over. And then I looked down at my legs, which were mangled on the bike, and my vision was all pink and green. I was sure I had fucked myself up, but just knowing I wasn't dead felt amazing after that moment. I went into work early one day by about three hours to pick up my paycheck and get some stuff done before I inevitably had to clock on. As I was depositing my check, a guy came in and babbled incoherently at me, but I knew that something had just gone horribly wrong. So I went out into the parking lot, and I saw this old lady, probably in her mid-70s, laying on the ground with blood pooling beneath her head as she was screaming in pain. She had tripped over one of those bars that act as curbs at the end of a parking spot. So I called 911 and was relaying what to do as my manager and a random person who happened to be an EMT comforted her and kept a press on her wound. The entire time that we were taking care of her and comforting her, she was saying things like, don't leave me, I don't want to be alone and my family is going to be so mad at me, I wasn't supposed to be out. This is really the reason it got me, because it was so sad to hear her say these things over and over again. So after I get off the phone with the 911 operator, I try to call her family and her neighbor, but nobody picks up, and that just makes matters even worse. It was around this time when she told us, wait. I have meat in my car. Someone please refrigerate it. Which generated a bit of a chuckle. After what felt like forever, the fire trucks finally got there and were working with her. Right after that, it started sprinkling rain, and then the sprinklers in the grass started to turn on, so we stomped them down and covered them with buckets. 
Then I finally got a call from her neighbor, and she came down to my store, and we pointed her to the hospital that the ambulance took her to. Overall, the whole thing scarred me a bit, as I still think about it as I walk into my store almost every shift. I never ended up finding out what happened to her. When I was in the second grade, I had a friend in the grade below me. She was the friend of a boy in my class who I didn't like, but she was nice, and we both liked to read, so we would talk about books on the bus. One day we were on the bus, sitting next to each other, talking about our latest pickups from the school library. We reached her stop, she said bye to me and got off the bus with her brother and older, middle school aged, sister. I watched her siblings cross the road, but my friend had stopped before crossing to tie her shoes. Our bus driver began honking his horn and screaming stop, stop out the window. I looked out the window in time to see her begin to cross before she was hit by the motorcycle. Her body flew up and hit the roof of our bus before hitting the road. The motorcycle stopped down the road, only half aware that he had hit something. I'll never forget her mother's scream. I watched my friend's unconscious body bleed out on the pavement, limbs broken and facing the wrong direction and everything. The bus erupted in panic. Due to our being part of an accident and the bus driver's determination to help her before the ambulance could arrive, we didn't move the bus. We sat there for a little over an hour before a second bus was sent to pick us up and finish our route. I couldn't take my eyes off her the entire time. My parents tried to talk to me about it afterward, and the school offered therapy, but I didn't really do either. I kind of just stuffed it down. She ended up dying in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. The school held a service, and her brother and sister left school for several months. As it would turn out, that accident gave me a severe case of PTSD. I've never been able to drive a car. The mere thought of cars makes me anxious. I was hospitalized after a suicide attempt a couple months ago. I'm doing significantly better after my official diagnosis and new medications. I'm not sure if I'll ever drive. It's also, may I mention, especially difficult to face PTSD as a civilian, not a cop or soldier. For some reason, Many people don't believe I have PTSD because I wasn't in either of the aforementioned professions. Don't judge, mental illness can happen to anyone. Up until recently, I did a lot of volunteer work, and once a year we took a group of orphans on a camp. Basically, a weekend to make them feel like the most important kids in the world. There was this little girl nicknamed Babayan, which is baboon in Afrikaans. She was born with fetal alcohol syndrome, which made her small and a little mentally challenged. Anyhow. The site we took them to was being terrorized by a baboon troop, which we were continuously warned not to engage as they were incredibly violent. One day, during free time, Baba Yan was playing alone on the deck when a huge baboon approached her. This thing was at least double her height and aggressive AF. Everybody around her stood dead still. Baba Yan had no clue what was going on and thought it was a plaything. I looked up from below the deck and saw the baboon start approaching her, and without thinking, I ran up the stairs and grabbed her while growling like an idiot at the thing. I wasn't sure what I was thinking, and the thing was probably a bit confused, but I ran away anyway. She was so close to being ripped to shreds. Such a scary moment. I went camping with my girlfriend back in the late 1990s. I think I'd just graduated college, maybe it was my senior year. Anyway, we got a little pup tent and super basic camping gear from Kmart. We get on the road and just drive aimlessly. Our whole intent was to just spend four days camping in different places and visiting whatever attractions we came across. We didn't really have any destination in mind. The first night, we stopped for dinner at some truck stop in Missouri and asked the waitress if there are any campgrounds around. She tells us there's one that's out of business, but people still crash there. We drive there, and everything is locked up. You can still get in, but the bathrooms and lodge are all locked. It also looks pretty dumpy, with a lot of garbage. The place is deserted, aside from another couple who set up camp pretty close to the entrance. Being a dog lover, my girlfriend notices that they've got a beagle, and she gets all gushy about how cute he is, and blah blah blah. I drive around the campground, which is laid out kind of like the Olympic rings, or two figure eights stacked on top of one another. We get to the very back of the campground, and it's filthy. We actually get a little nervous because it seems like this place is just a haven for drunks, drug addicts, and assholes who come here to party. But no one is here just their remnants. As I'm driving, I see a little side road that's a bit overgrown. I figure it might be less used and we'd be less visible, so I head down, and it's actually a nice little clearing with four or five sites. They're pretty clean, and we set up camp. We play a game she brought called Mancala until it gets dark, and then we just hang out talking. Around 10 p.m., we notice the very faint campfire of the couple we passed earlier. Nothing special. 
I just noticed it through the trees and didn't realize we were that close. We head into the tent and proceed to get frisky. She was kind of vocal, but not screaming or anything, and I heard a dog barking. It's not just a random bark. This thought is barking like crazy. It sees something or is barking out of concern or fear. My girlfriend keeps riding. Then, we hear a loud, blood-curdling yelp from the dog. Then a woman screams. Then we hear a male voice yelling. We can't make out the words, but it sounds like an argument. A girlfriend abruptly stops. I've got a handful of tits and a thumb on a clitoral, and we're both silent and motionless. It was pitch black, but I can only imagine we both had confused and concerned looks on our faces. The argument continues, and we're trying to figure out what's being said. Then I hear a twig snap somewhat nearby. Not close, but not far either. All of a sudden, I get this intense feeling of dread. I guide her off and whisper, get in the car now. I grab my clothes and realize she's getting dressed. My heart is racing. I'm terrified. I really feel like someone is coming for me and wants to kill me. I say quietly but forcefully, don't get dressed. Just get. In. The. Car. She says in her normal volume, I'm not going out naked. That's when we hear a guy say, did you hear that? It was quiet, but it was clear. They couldn't have been more than 100 feet away. Our car was maybe 10 to 15 feet from the tent. I pull the keys out of my pocket and whisper, we gotta go now. I unzip the tent, and we run to the car. As I hit the unlock button, the headlights and taillights come on. There are two guys standing about 50 to 60 feet away. They freeze for a second and then start running at us. We jump in the car, and as I'm jamming the key in the ignition, they get to the front of the car. I get the car started, and I look up to see these two standing there. They're about mid-30s and look like classic bedraggled hillbillies. One has a big stick in his hand, and he's holding it up. I had backed up to a tree, so I could only go forward. Keep in mind that my girlfriend and I are buck naked. The dome light hasn't even gone off yet, and I hear the one guy say, what you all got in there? I scream, move. The other guy comes to my girlfriend's window, leans down, and says, she got some nice titties. And she did. They were spectacular, she grabs her clothes and bunches them up to cover them up a little. I roll down my window about two inches and yell, I will run you the fuck over, move. The guy with the stick says, I'll take some of their titties first. The two start laughing, and the guy at the window leans down, and the first thing I think is that he's grabbing a rock to break the window or he's going to knife the tire. I throw it in drive and tap the gas, hoping to scare him away. Hillbilly, with the stick, doesn't even flinch. He slams the butt of the stick on the hood, looks positively evil as he looks me square in the eye, and yells, you give me all the money you got, and you can go. My girlfriend's window shatters, she screams, I hit the gas, hillbilly rolls up and off the side of the hood, and I'm off. We get to the front of the campground, and there's a classically hillbilly pickup truck blocking the entrance. The couple who were there are now gone, their car was gone, but their tent is on fire. I quickly scan the entrance area and see a broken chunk of fence, the wood ranch fence with the three horizontal wood pieces. I head right for it and get out onto the road. We just haul ass. Maybe a mile down, we see the beagle run limping along the road. My girlfriend screams to stop the dog. I slammed on the brakes after making sure no one was following. She gets out and finishes getting dressed. I'm still buck naked, so I jump out and start throwing on clothes. She gets the dog, and his paw is all bloody. I see headlights coming from way behind and screaming, get in the fucking car. And we're off again. We get to a little one-horse town, and nothing is open. Even the fucking police station is closed. We park behind the police station, and my girlfriend checks out the dog. He's okay, but it looks like someone stepped on his foot, and he was bleeding from around his nails. She wrapped his paw, and we kind of rested for an hour or two until a cop finally showed up. We told him what happened, and he actually yelled at us for trespassing. Okay, yes, we did, but seriously? He says he'll check it out and that we should head on back home. I tell him I want to file a police report for my insurance, and he says, I don't have time for that. I have to go see a campground. He just leaves. My girlfriend and I wait until morning to file a police report with another officer. The first guy never came back and never reported anything. And we left. Instead of finishing our nice little weekend adventure, we drove straight to my girlfriend's mom's house. The dog had a tag, but it didn't have owner information. It just had the dog's name, Rookie. My girlfriend's mom had five dogs and lived on a farm. She was happy to take in Rookie, and he seemed happy to have a bunch of playmates. We looked online to find the owners, but the internet back in the 90s wasn't anything like it is today. We never found the owners. We never found anything about that campground. 
Rook must have been fairly young because he lived until 2011. This happened in 1998. My girlfriend and I are no longer together, but her mom liked me and sent me an email when Rookie died. Anyway, that's it. Oh, I almost forgot. Damage to the car was $4,800. Body work and paint on the hood, new front bumper, got cracked somehow, new window, new headlight assembly, broke it on the fence, and I had to get the right side repainted because I scraped the fence from front to back as I was leaving. Thank God for insurance. And since I'm sure someone will ask. The campground was north or northeast of Jordan, Missouri. Long story, but, this fall, I briefly lived in this dorm on campus with a bunch of other girls in the loft room, we were in temporary housing because we withdrew ourselves from sorority recruitment, and were waiting for permanent on-campus housing. The rest of the dorm had singles, and people were known as shut-ins because they lived alone. The dorm had a 24-hour quiet policy, and it was generally antisocial. Before I leave, I remember the girls complaining about a weird smell that had been lingering for a week. We had no idea what it was and didn't give it too much thought. After two weeks, I moved out and got an apartment with seven other girls on the West Campus. Another week or two passes, and one of my former roommates texts me about how a dead body was discovered in one of the rooms in the old dorm. An email from our university confirmed a student had passed away, but they didn't give any details. There are rumors of suicide, but those are still rumors. Absolutely tragic, it kind of haunts me that we smelled it and didn't try to investigate further. There are two incidents that stand out to me. When I was a kid, my mom was attacked by our Akita while I watched Wishbone. At the time it happened, I could only hear what was happening as the living room where I was watching TV didn't face the backyard where my mom was attacked. The sound I heard froze me to the couch. Like a tiger's roar ripping through the friendly droning of PBS. What followed next was my mom screaming as our dog bit her. He luckily only attacked her arms, but combined with the growling and the wailing for help, you would have thought much worse was going down. The next thing I heard was my sister running outside to throw something that distracted our dog from my mom so she, my mom, could get inside. They called my dad and cried together as they waited for him to show up. All of this played out as I sat on the couch, too afraid to move. My mom had to get stitches, and my dog was put down. Years later, there was an armed burglary at the donut shop behind my house. I was in bed, it was very, very late, and the gunshots woke me up. I'd never heard a gunshot before, not in real life, so I was utterly unprepared for how loud it was. In my mind, it sounded like it came from inside the house or next door. That's how close the donut place was. I ran to my mom's room across from mine to tell her, but she had a cold and was knocked out on NyQuil. She didn't believe me, which made everything much scarier. Her room faced the shop, and she was still too out of it to hear anything. All I could do was hide in my room and hope the burglars, I didn't know the shooting took place at the donut shop at the time, that were, in my mind, next door wouldn't rob our house too. It was the early 90s, and I was about 6 years old. I was home on a very dreary and rainy day due to having an extremely high fever. And after an ice bath and a fudgesicle shoved into my mouth, dad gave me a bottle of blue power aid, and then I flopped down on the beanbag in the living room. My parents had a bad habit of recording movies on VHS and not labeling them. Amidst my delirium, I decided to systematically go and rewind every blank VHS tape and play them from the beginning so that I could see the opening credits and label the movies with a silver sharpie. This method worked very well for about 99% of all of the unlabeled VHS tapes. It was great until I hit that one tape. Mind you, I had a fever of around 102 degrees at the time. I rewind one more tape after doing like 60 already. I rewind it all the way, like all the other ones. I push play, expecting to see opening credits, but all I see is a boy riding down the hallway on a tricycle. He goes up to a door that looks like a hotel room and seems very nervous about it. He then walks into the room and moves to the bathroom, where he sees the decayed body of a woman in a bathtub. The boy then freaks out and runs to the hallway and shuts the door behind him, but he doesn't realize that the door opens inwards, not outwards. At this point, I am very scared. And then, at the peak of my suspense, the door opens, and a green, moldy hand grabs the boy by his nape and drags him into the room. Oh, how I freaked out. I screamed and ran across the room, burying my face in the cushions of the couch. My parents were shocked and worried for a moment. Dad asked what happened as he walked out of the bedroom. I described what happened, and then he had a chuckle and said, Oh, I see you found the shining. But what really did it for me was that a few moments later, after I had calmed down a bit, I went to the bathroom across the house, and my mom was in there, beautifying her face. She was using that green paste that people put on their faces to tighten up their faces and make themselves look younger. 
So when I walked into the bathroom, I thought it was unoccupied. After just seeing that scene from The Shining, my mom turned and looked at me with this sickly green paste all over her face and reached out to me to hug me. I screamed. I screamed so hard that my voice broke, and all that could come out of me was just air. A slow, quiet hissing sound came from my throat, and I tried to run but couldn't move. I turned at the waist, but my feet were locked in place. I was literally paralyzed from the waist down, with my hands clawing at the doorframe as I tried to desperately pull myself away from my impending doom. That was probably the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. I was literally paralyzed with fear.